Well, thank you very much, Terasan, for this wonderful uh, uh, introduction. And uh, I'm really honored to be here. I wish I could be in Tokyo and see you all in person. And uh, hopefully, this will once again be safe uh, in the near future, and we can then join uh, all together in one room. So for today, uh, let's do it this way. And I have I brought some PowerPoints, which I will share. Um, so I want to talk about the business reinvention of Japan and the digital transformation. And this book that, as you just mentioned, uh, uh, is now being translated into Japanese. And I think the title might be Kaisha no Saiko. Uh, so this reinvention of the Japanese company. So let me uh, uh, jump right in and uh, uh, and, and so the, the, when I talk about the reinvention of Japanese companies, I get a lot of uh, comments like, well, Japan is like, you know, 20 years, lost 20 years, deflation, it's not ready in the regions and the government debt. So there's a lot of negativity. Uh, and so, you know, I, actually, I think this, all of these negative things are true. I could also give a long talk about the negative things about the United States economy or the German economy. Uh, but, but, you know, there are lots of analyses of this. My question is a very different question. And that is, if all of this is true, how can it be that after 20 years of negative news from Japan, Japan is still the third largest economy in the world. So there must be something working in Japan. Otherwise, this would not be possible. So I decided to write a book about not what's wrong with Japan, but what is working uh, in Japan. And um, so in my, in my book, I um, talk about how in response to changing global competition, Japan's leading companies that I will zoom in the leading companies have begun to reinvent themselves. Um, and uh, that's important for uh, US readers. So this book is originally written for American readers, right? This is important for, 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 for people in the US and, and, and in Europe to know because uh, Japan represents a, an alternative way of reorganizing, which is slow and stable and, and, and does it without some of the negative social consequences. Uh, of, of, of what would happen in the United States. Um, in terms of strategy, I argue that Japanese, Japan's best companies have uh, adopted what I call an aggregate niche strategy, which I'll explain momentarily. And in management uh, matters, I talk about how a corporate renewal is underway, where uh, these leading companies are changing their corporate culture and their work processes, and how this is actually a very exciting moment uh, in corporate Japan. Now you might say, wait a minute, how can both be correct? How can Japan's negative news be correct and this positive story also be true? And I think that Japan's situation right now is one of these representations of the 2080 rule, where 20% of uh, input explain 80% of output, right? Or uh, in business, 20% of customers uh, explain 80% of revenues. And in this case, I would say that, you know, th let's not be nitpicky on 2080, but, uh, but a small portion of Japanese companies explain the majority of Jap Japan's economic successes. And so, uh, so that's possible. It's possible that there are good companies and bad companies at the same time. All right, so uh, here's the uh, content of my book. It has 10 chapters. I begin with uh, talking about sort of business culture and some background on how lifetime employment is changing. Then uh, I'll, I'll talk about the aggregate niche strategy, which I will do today uh, and explain what that's about and how that's, that has changed Japan's role in global business. I also have a chapter on corporate governance and private equity markets and how that's important for the reinvention. Um, I, I, I end on a note on the, on the digital transformation, which I will uh, also talk about today. And then also I want to end my talk today on this matter of culture change. So let me take you there. Oh, but before I take you there, here's, here's the basic core argument. Right? The core argument that is that, 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 that the leading companies 
uh, are taking have taken on a new global competitive position that is in upstream markets. And this has led to what I call a Japan inside strategy. So it used to be the Japanese companies dominated consumer and product markets. Like it's a Sony television or it's a, you know, uh, uh, audio, uh, you know, uh, television and all of this came from Japan. That's not true anymore. Uh, but now it's the input parts that make my television or my stereo system better that come from Japan. And that's not visible to the naked eye. So not many people know about it, but that doesn't mean it's not there. And, um, and I want to convince you today that that particular moment of the Japanese corporate reinvention also positions Japan well to be front runners in the DX. And uh, so that requires a complete culture change in the Japanese organization. Okay, so you might say, why do Japanese companies have to reinvent? Well, there, there, are, there are five shocks, right? So there's the rise of Asian competitors in China. There's the globalization of supply chains. There's a digital transformation that's global. And then domestically, there's a labor shortage and of course, uh, more pressures on corporate profitability. So that changes the business model. And so take that together, these old conglomerates and these large industrial installations are slowly but certainly being replaced by being by, by new, agile, uh, smaller, you know, sort of faster, speedier, smarter businesses. And I want to convince you that that's an opportunity, not a threat. Uh, it offers ways for Japanese companies to profit from this digital disruption and um and and so that's there that the, the 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 question really at the end is can japanese companies use this moment to profit from it okay so uh let me go back a, a little bit more i mean i i know many of you know this but i just want to make sure we're on the same page here uh so i think we are this is a book i i wrote in 2008 which i, I thought actually was a pretty good book but it came out in 2008, which was not a good year. So uh, people cared about the global financial crisis and not so much about uh, you know, Japan. But, but it, we, we can all recall that the post-war Japanese successes were based on mass producing high quality consumer end products. And success was measured in sales and large companies had access to talent and technology. And so it set a lot of incentives for Japanese companies to diversify as much as they could. And then came the bubble economy, which further stimulated diversification. Uh, and when the bubble burst, of course, there were these three excesses of you know, too many assets, too many people, too much debt. So at the turn of the century, a lot of Japanese companies started this sentakuto shuchu, which I translated as choose and focus. And we were all very excited at the time. This would be a new beginning. So I wrote the book. However, it turns out that that was short lived because of the global financial crisis. And then came, of course, the, the great Tohoku earthquake, which was just another crisis. So it was a little bit interrupted, uh, this sentakuto shuchu. And it started a little bit with like exiting. Um, what we call low hanging fruit. So the easy businesses, a lot of Japanese companies started exiting those, but the problem, and, 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 and that was, that was great. And they had to do that because, uh, you know, that was when South Korea and Taiwan began to copy Japan's successes. And we have all seen this, right. Um, uh, Japan will, can, cannot compete as either on a cost basis or on a size basis, uh, in Asia. And um, and so the way out is to to leave assembly and go into input materials or components. And this next slide, everybody in Japan knows, uh, which is of course the smile curve. I just want to bring you to your attention that Americans do not know this chart. This is an Asian phenomenon. This describes an Asian dynamic. If you show this chart to an American, they will not know what this is. But of course, we know that this is like the 
uh, uh, Acer CEO drawing this on a napkin saying that there's absolutely no money in assembly and the money is at the high end of the smile, which is either in the, in the components and materials or in the retail. So this is of course, this repositioning, this reinvention that Japanese companies are doing. Um, and this is a, a chart from, from uh, METI, NEDO. Uh, I call it my bubble chart and I use it uh, uh, with great uh, joy. So thank you for making this. Uh, so what this shows is a global market size here, which goes from somewhere, you know, uh, Isen, Okuen to uh, Senchoen, so 10 tr trillion market. And then here's the percentage of uh, combined market share of Japanese companies. And so orange is automobiles. And we know that, that the Japanese car makers are doing very well. And here's hybrid. I am interested in the bubbles on the far right. These are these tiny little dots, right? And, um, and these are niches that are on average anywhere between $1 billion and $10 billion in size. And Japanese companies combine to 100% global market share. And that's my interest. And I call this an aggregate niche. And I think the Japanese for this will be Shugo Nichi, but I'm, I'm not quite sure yet. And with aggregate, I mean, it, it adds up. There's one niche and another niche and another niche. In the aggregate, this makes uh, for a very powerful position of Japanese companies in the global supply chains. Okay, so this aggregate niche, uh, according to this study that Nedo did, um, there were there are about 500 products in that study. They're all manufacturing products. So this does not uh, include some of the things where Japan would have more niches like DX businesses. But but in these in these studies in these categories that Nedo studied, uh, Japanese companies had 50 percent or more in 500 products that were each about you know, 5 billion. So you can do the math, it's a lot of money. And, and these are not just exports, right? These are global production networks. And I want to stress here that this is not a hidden champion story. These niches are not hidden champions. That's a, also an interesting story, but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is that this, this is the new phase of the competitive thrust of very large, Japanese companies that have positioned into these niches where they occupy uh, deep tech leadership. And I personally think that this is a brilliant strategy because these niches are too small for China uh, and they're not reachable. They're difficult to make, difficult to imitate. Uh, they, and, and of course, uh, the, the companies are not standing still. They're constantly innovating and getting better and better. And so these niches are, you know, maybe this is not a hundred year uh, strategy, but for the next 10 years, they look pretty stable to me. Okay, so there are two dimensions of this aggregate niche. Um, uh, uh, one is that um, one company from Japan occupies several niches. So for instance, JSRs and photo resists plus polarizer film plus brightness film, right? Or uh, FANUC has numerical controls and robot robotics and factory automation. And then the, up, the other way this could aggregate is that several Japanese companies occupy one technology niche. So for instance, in photo resists, uh, Japanese companies have a 97% world market share, right? And, and it's not just a JSR, it's TOK and others. So uh, similar things I could tell you about carbon fiber or semiconductor materials. And I think many of you know this, but, uh, but I hope that me giving this a word uh, makes it a more tangible thing. All right, so, um, so, so after all of this choose and focus and this repositioning, uh, there is still this challenge that a lot of uh, large Japanese companies are still conglomerates. There are still lots of places that have lots of subsidiaries and are pretty large. And so um, there is now this choose and focus version 2.0, which is a little bit different from version 1.0, which was like the low hanging fruit and just going on a diet, right? This new um, choose and focus 2.0 is about not only becoming more agile, but also to become a different athlete. So it's becoming quicker and competing through technologies, not sides, 
um, and, and creating dependencies and profit margin, but it's also about changing the identity of the company. Uh, I have talked, and, and in the book I talk about uh, Hitachi, which is a great example, where there's a whole movement going on of exiting some of the business that used to make Hitachi, like metals and chemicals and medical, and becoming a, a sort of a smart city infrastructure player with a data solution uh, core. Right, and uh, maybe Yoshizaki-san can tell us later that NEC might be trying to do something similar. Right, so there's also an identity change that's going on that's very exciting to me. So this is happening now. Just want to say that usually such a transformation in the U.S. Uh, IBM has undergone such a thing. It takes ten years, so we have to be patient. Right, uh, and in fact, it could take longer. All right, so let me move on to a uh, second portion of my uh, presentation. The question is, okay, so how does this relate to the digital transformation? And, and what does this mean for Japanese companies in the DX? And first of all, uh, I want to point out that America does not use DX as a vocabulary. This is a Japanese word. And, and I think it's because the like, katakana is so clumsy, right? Digital transformation. And so DX, so, so, and so in, in, you open the newspaper in Japan, it's DX. You open the newspaper in the United States, we use words that end in tech, like fintech, insurtech, agrotech, prop tech for real estate, mat tech for marketing, med tech for health sciences, right? So there are all these new words. And so what actually is the DX, right? So the, the, I think the American view is that there was this trigger of a of great advances in technology and computing powers and storage and combined with great advances in analytical techniques like big data mining, right? And so we can divide it into hardware and software. So on the hardware side, we have sort of the sensing and vision technologies, 5G networks and, and communication and connectivity and autonomous systems and robots and, and, and the cloud, which is really, of course, a data center. And then we have the software. And I think it's fair to say that Japanese companies are very good, very well positioned to compete in the hardware and I would say we don't know who's going to win the software because this is just beginning, right? And uh, uh, I often hear this, that people think that China and the US own the software side. I, I'm not so sure that's true. I, I think that we will not know for a while. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about Japan, but of course you all know this. Uh, uh, these are all things I pull from, from Japanese websites, but, but Toyota actually gives us a great example of, of the business view of the DX. So um, today, as you know, Toyota sells 9 million cars annually for something like $250 billion. Toyota-san tells us that by 2030, the idea might be that they sell no cars at all, but provide transportation services as an MAAS company, mobility as a service company. And the revenue will come from a subscription model, similar to Netflix or Spotify today. So we subscribe to Toyota services uh, with a monthly fee. And every time we want to go someplace, we just push a button on our phone or our watch. And um, some mode of transportation will show up, a flying car, a self-driving car, a pallet, right? So, um, so that's very interesting. Uh, and, and there are a bunch of interesting things we can study. One is that who is the car worker of the future, right? It's not going to be somebody who makes cars because this car is going to be pretty standard and a robot can make it. The new car worker will be working on this IT platform, offering us services and making sure that we like the services and that we pay our subscription and we get extra uh, attention. And so, uh, so for me as a business scholar, what's really interesting about this is what is that business model going to look like? Where is the money in this new world, right? Um, because it will be many lower, lower revenues because $250 billion is a lot of dollars and, and selling cars. So switching to uh, a recurring profit will be very different from as a business model. And the differentiation will not be through Toyota production system, 
uh, or or high class manufacturing, but it's actually through the just in time delivery of people. So this is all very exciting. Toyota Sun tells us this will happen by 2030, which Americans find unbelievable. I think he may be he may be onto something. He, he may be able to do this. So let's let's watch uh, let's watch that. But this is going to be very exciting. So we need a new type of employee. We need new skills. I, I won't have time to get into. Let me skip the Manabi Niyoshi, but I want to talk a little bit more about Japan and this. So in the manufacturing world, let me just make sure I can forward this. Oops. So so what what's exciting about manufacturing is that this is actually where the DX is going to happen first, right? It will material lies first and we have a use case here. And so what's going to happen uh, in manufacturing is that we're switching to industry 4.0, which is digital manufacturing. And so today I was talking about Toyota, so let's stay with cars, right? So the car goes out a conveyor belt and there's all kinds of stages of production. And currently they are governed by what's called the production pyramid, which is this thing where there are four different levels of software sitting on top of each other. Uh, and then this is planning out in six months. And the vision is that this will all mesh into one advanced software solution package. So we don't have to understand this to see how this is exciting actually in, in terms of business model. There's actually a chart that uh, that that Meti put together uh, two years ago, which I took and then I went to Germany and talked to some German engineers about this and we adjusted it a little bit, but basically here's the story of where is the money in the future of uh, manufacturing. And so currently we are at this, um, uh, let me see if I can, we're at this uh, Gemba shop floor level where we have, you know, robots and machinery, and Fanuc is governing this, and there's some, lots of sensors, and also from Japan, manufacturing equipment, a lot of software, um, and this is being disrupted. So the next step in this will be that there will be integrated systems where the value creation, the money is in advanced system solutions, where all of this becomes possible in terms of, you know, single lot production, high customization, the process uh, optimization, supply chain optimization. And then on top of this, we have the cloud, uh, which currently actually is, is it's not quite happening yet. So because this is happening on the on the edge and an edge computing. Okay, so um, a student, um, so so the, so the disruption is happening at this down level. So a student uh, at UC San Diego, uh, who actually is is from Meti, sat down and, and, and collected all of the, the 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 players here. And so what we see is that the current um, the current dominant players are German and Japanese companies. There's a little bit of US in here with Rockwell and Honeywell, but most of this is, is like Kians and Yaskawa and, and then on, on the, and, and, and Melco. Uh, and then on the on the German side, Siemens is sort of a big, big player. And then on the software side, it's, it's mostly Germany and, and a little bit other Europe. But as we move up to this new level, what we see is that companies like NEC and of course Hitachi uh, and Fujitsu, Melco, Fanuc, DMG, Mori, Denso are uh, all jockeying for position here, um, and 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 uh, with with the Germans, so, uh, GE is out, and KUKA who used to be German is now, you know, Chinese is not happening. So I'm very excited about this chart. Um, uh, and by the way, once the cloud comes in, so usually it's said that this is a GAFA play with Oracle, Cisco in here, but. But I want to throw SoftBank and Recruit in here as well, right? So it's not as if Japan is not competing up here, but that's maybe for another for another broadback lunch in the future. So let me take five more minutes, if I may, and just uh, uh, go quickly into the culture change thing. So the challenge really is that um, how do you turn a large traditional Japanese conglomerate with a culture of anzen daiichi and meticulous execution? of production processes into a 21st century DX competitor that is leading in breakthrough innovation. Right? This is the puzzle that the Japanese companies are facing right now. And, and, and I would argue also the government uh, because they're, they're, you know, the government has the same challenge. So um, the analytical tool we can use 
is what's called the alignment model. So this is what we teach sort of in, in teaching the business school MBA program, right? So if you have, uh, and, and then this is built on, on some of the work of O'Reilly and Tushman on the Ryokiki no Ke. So, so the strategy is fairly simple, right? We figure out what business we're in and how do we compete. And then we have to execute the strategy. And in order to do this, we have to look at four things. One is, what are the critical tasks that we really need to get done? What is the mindset of the people that are doing these tasks? Right? What, 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 how are they motivated? What do they know? What are they good at? Uh, what is the culture uh, defined as? What are the norms and expectations and the right behavior around this? And um, how are people promoted and assessed and, and, and paid and so forth? And so the, the business school 101 is that uh, if, if this is tightly aligned, then you get great performance. Okay, many of you have seen this. So let me do this for, uh, let me apply this to the post-war Japan, uh, prototypical successful Japanese company. Let's stick with, let's stay with Toyota or any other like manufacturer, right? So um, the, the strategy in the old days was high volume, low cost mass production, sales growth, market share, uh, the critical tasks, operational efficiency, cost down, quality up, Kaizen, get it, make it better, better. The people needed for this were in operational excellence or good engineers that had functional expertise that could do this really well. The organization was about PDCIs, A cycles, obedience, like make your boss look good, don't, don't rock the boat. There was lifetime employment with lockstep careers. There was wage parity. And the culture was about compliance and obedience, discipline, being meticulous about uh, the assignment, hard work, long hours, follow process, you all uh, know this much better than I do. And by the way, there's this, the, the, the post-war Japanese success was that this was a fit in most organizations. And still today, I would say it's a perfect alignment for the, the for production. And it, it still will be important for the sort of the monozukuri world uh, of Japanese industry. So this needs to be preserved at one level because it's very useful. On the other hand, what's the alignment you need for the DX? What's the, what's the corporate culture? What is the breakthrough innovation alignment that you need? Well, today the strategy is about agility and adaptiveness, right? It's about technology leadership. So the critical tasks are breakthrough innovation, fast sensing and seizing, new business development, technical excellence, you know, being, at the, being at the cutting uh, edge of the technology trans frontier. That, that's what the DX is about. Okay, what kind of people do you need for that? You need people with a peripheral vision that are very creative, that have a high tolerance for failure, that, um, that, that, that can work well in diverse teams that have a different new perspective. Uh, you probably need to redefine FAIR as equitable. So you need meritocracy, incentives to experiment, individualized career tracks, much longer term loser metrics rather than like monthly salaries or something. And uh, maybe the most important part is you need a culture that is about curiosity and exploration and stepping out of bounds and being tolerant and diverse. And that is the challenge, right? So how do you create this new culture? And, um, and by the way, before I uh, uh, finish on this, I just wanna say that th there's this challenge of how do we even translate culture into Japanese? And I would like to point out to you that I don't think it's bunka. Because Bunker talks about it's like museums and heritage and tradition and so forth. That's not what it is. It's not DNA either, because DNA cannot be changed. Um, Karicha sounds way too foreign. So I would recommend that we think about this as something like the Yarikata, like the way we do things around here. You could also use Kanko, maybe our practices. So um, so you so so culture when we when we do research on culture we think about culture as having three components. One is the content, which is the actual behavior that's prescribed. You don't do this, you do this, right? You you don't you 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 wear a jacket, you don't wear a jacket. You you uh, you 
uh, whatever the, the company prescribes. Then there is the dimension of consensus. So do people agree about this? And then there's intensity. How strongly do people feel about this culture? And content differs by setting. So when we go to a baseball stadium or a football stadium, we behave very differently than when we go to a Beethoven symphony, right? So that is actually the content. So, so in a football stadium, we can be in a t-shirt and we can you know, cheer on and we can noisy and so forth. And you can make all kinds of you know, bodily emotions. In a symphony, we sit very quiet and we're very nicely dressed and we're very well behaved. So, uh, so the point is cultures, are socially created norms that guide our behavior in a certain setting. And this can be managed. You can change the content of what is the right behavior in a situation. You can tell people, uh, so, so I like to give the example that, that you know, uh, 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 in, in the United States, in California, which is a very open, loose place, right? So if my colleague were to come to work and dye their hair green, you know, I would say, well, that's cute. You know, you dyed your hair green. That's kind of, that's kind of pretty. Uh, in, in Japan, if, if one of your uh, folks came to work with their hair dyed green, you would be concerned. Are they okay? You know, is this, are they, are they all right? So, so you could actually, as a boss, say, it's okay to do that in my company, right? So to change, um, to change culture uh, is basically to redefine what is the right behavior at the workplace. And it's a very care, you can do it. It's very, you know, you need to methodologically go about this and sort of, you know, uh, allow and highlight, you know, this, this sort of new behavior and showcase, but it can be done. And we already see this happening, right? So I think on the right lower side, this is uh, the typical ministry uh, office. And, the, uh, and now we're going to the three address offices and, and we talk about work-life balance and that's happening. And, and this is, of course, uh, to induce new behavior. So let me stop. I'm over time. Um, I've, I've, I've raised a lot of issues, so I'm looking forward to discussing this with you. So uh, here's my summary. Japanese, Japan's leading companies are undergoing this pivot, this reinvention uh, into difficult to make, difficult to copy global niches. I think that is fantastic. Um, this requires great effort of internal reorganization and culture change. Uh, but it's also a huge competitive advantage moment, especially in digital manufacturing, but also, as we'll hear from Yoshizaki-san soon, also in the IT sector. And the DX is only just beginning. So the question really is, will Japan and will Japan's companies be able to grab the lucky moment? And can we increase on the 2080, right? So 20% of Japanese companies create, explain 80% of outcome. Can we increase the number of Japanese companies that are grabbing this moment and uh, are repositioning? So uh, so thank you. And uh, let, me, let me stop here and stop my share and uh, look forward to your comments. Thank you.